Today we're out here in the forest taking a look at the 2018 Genesis G80. This particular model is the all-new 3.3T Sport trim. The G80 is the artist formerly known as the Hyundai Genesis, because for 2017, Hyundai decided to spin off Genesis as its own luxury brand. So Genesis is to Hyundai what Lexus is to Toyota. The spin-off of the Genesis brand is a little bit interesting because at the moment this Genesis G80 is going to be sold at Hyundai dealers as well as at Genesis dealers. However, the Genesis G90 and the upcoming Genesis G70, the models that are larger and smaller than this, will only be available at Genesis dealers. Of course, at this point in time, those Genesis dealers will be tied with existing Hyundai dealers, but it means that in an area like the Bay Area where I live, you won't be able to buy the other models at every Hyundai dealer. Only about half of those dealers are signed up to actually sell them, but most dealers will be able to sell you this Genesis G80 right here. To create the Genesis G80 from the Hyundai Genesis, they swapped in new bumpers, front and rear, and tweaked things all around the vehicle. And then for 2018, they decided to put a brand new 3.3 liter twin turbo V6 engine under the hood, give us an all new front end versus the rest of the G80 lineup, and they've packed this vehicle with all of their latest safety features standard. That means that for 2018, all Genesis G80 models will get radar adaptive cruise control with pedestrian detection, autonomous braking, and their bevy of safety systems that were formerly optional. That means that the G80, which was already one of the best buys in the mid-size luxury sedan segment, is an even better value for 2018. Now we recently reviewed the V8 version of the Genesis G80, you can find that video on our channel, so this video will really just be focusing on the 3.3 liter turbo sport model that we're looking at here. For the sport trim of the G80, Genesis decided to take their existing grille design and make it a little bit meaner, so we get an all new design right here inside of the same basic shape that we find in the other G80 models. A trim strip that actually curls in right here to sort of give this an angry scowl. We have LED headlamps in our particular model. All G80 models come with either HID headlamps or LED headlamps depending on the trim that you get. Because the radar cruise control system is now standard, all models will have this panel right here that hides the radar adaptive cruise control sensor. Just above that, we have the camera for the 360 degree camera system, and of course, the Genesis winged logo. When creating the Genesis brand, they made one very important decision right up front, and that was to make all of the Genesis models either rear wheel drive or rear wheel drive based. That includes the G80 we're looking at right here, the G90, the G70, and all of their upcoming crossovers. If that sounds an awful lot like BMW to you, then you're right. And that's really what separates Genesis from Lexus or even Cadillac, which do have rear wheel drive models, but then they also have a lot of front wheel drive models. In terms of overall size, the 2018 G80 slots somewhere between the Lexus GS and the last generation Lexus LS in terms of overall length. At 196.5 inches long, this is about four inches longer than a Lexus GS. You'll really notice that right back here in the rear passenger compartment, as well as in the trunk. It's about two inches longer than a BMW 5 Series. That puts this on the long end of the mid-size luxury sedan category, as long as you're not looking at the extended wheelbase options. This is gonna be about six inches shorter than the Infiniti Q70L, and about four inches shorter than the 2018 Volvo S90, which has received a significant stretch for the 2018 model year. Very much like the 5 Series, the Lexus GS, the Mercedes-Benz E-Class, etc., we have a solid rear wheel drive proportion in the G80. We have this very long hood up front, Front wheels are pushed very close to the front of the vehicle. That's different than entries like the S90 or even the Audi A6. Instead of twin exhaust tips, we find quad exhaust tips on the 3.3 liter turbocharged version and a slightly tweaked rear bumper with this black section right down here. Like the rest of the Genesis lineup, we have these distinctive rear tail lamps which wrap from the body on over to the trunk lid and another camera right back here for the 360 degree camera system. For 2018, we now find three engines under this hood. Things start out with the same 3.8 liter V6 engine that we've seen in the Genesis for a while that produces 311 horsepower. And of course, you can still get the naturally aspirated 5 liter V8 engine producing 420 horsepower and 383 pound-feet of torque. An interesting bit of trivia is that the Genesis G80 is one of the last vehicles in this segment to still offer a naturally aspirated V8 engine. Of course, we're here to talk about this all-new 3.3 liter twin turbo V6 engine. This produces 365 horsepower and 376 pound-feet of torque, and this is the same engine you'll find in the larger Genesis G90. All three engines are mated to a standard 8-speed automatic transmission that was designed specifically for the Genesis line of vehicles. We also have available all-wheel drive. 
When it comes to fuel economy, you'll get the best rating in the 3.8 liter V6 model. The twin turbo model comes in right at 20 miles per gallon, whether you get the rear wheel drive model or the all wheel drive model, and then that drops several MPG if you want to get the V8 engine. You might be wondering why the fuel economy is a little bit lower on the Genesis G80 than some of the competitive vehicles in this segment. The reason is the curb weight. The Genesis G80 is fairly heavy. This is almost 25% heavier than something like a Jaguar XF. When it comes to front seat comfort, I'm going to give this trim 9 out of 10 points. This model features an extending thigh cushion, four-way adjustable lumbar support, inflatable side bolsters. We, of course, have an electric tilt telescopic steering column that's also memory linked. You should know that much like we see in certain Lexus models, the passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver. It lacks the inflatable side bolsters and the extending thigh cushion, although it does still get the four-way lumbar support. When it comes to rear seat comfort, the class-leading combined legroom figure, and that would be front row plus second row, really helps the G80 out here. As I said before, the G80 is one of the longer entries in this mid-size luxury sedan segment, and that's really obvious when you hop in the back seat because we have class-leading combined legroom, and that's front row plus second row. If you want more legroom than this in the back of your luxury vehicle, you'll have to get something like the Infiniti Q70L or the Volvo S90 for 2018. Those will have a few inches more rear legroom, now, it's important to keep in mind that the desire for really swoopy, sexy profiles in this category has caused a reduction in rear headroom. So my head does touch the ceiling if I sit very upright in the rear seat, even though we have class-leading headroom in this particular model. You'll definitely find less in the competition, especially if you start shopping this with something like the Cadillac CTS. If you move over to the middle seat, the lack of headroom is definitely noticeable. I do have to cock my head to one side. Keep in mind, of course, that the 10 out of 10 point score is only within this category. So obviously these rear seats are not as cushy or as comfortable as a full-size luxury sedan like the Genesis G90 or a Mercedes-Benz S-Class, but these are very, very comfortable for the mid-size category. Moving all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, this front seat is all the way back in its tracks, and I still have about half an inch of legroom left. At 15.3 cubic feet, the trunk in the Genesis is a little bit smaller in terms of overall volume than the Lexus GS, but because of its overall shape, it ends up being a little bit more practical. Although this trunk is a little bit smaller than what we find in the BMW 5 Series at over 18 cubic feet, this is notably larger than the trunks of the Infiniti Q70, the Audi A6, or especially the Volvo S90, which has a fairly small trunk for this category. Thanks to the generous size of this cargo area and the fact that we find a donut spare tire under the cargo area load floor, I'm going to give this trunk 8 out of 10 points in our exclusive trunk comfort index. We do lose one point because although we have a donut spare tire under there, it seems that there's a decent amount of wasted space. The way they had arranged the jack and other components in that cargo area, they could have given us a little bit more trunk space. We do have a well-placed helper handle to help you close the trunk lid and, of course, a power trunk. On the inside, we find this large panoramic moonroof, which goes almost all the way over the rear passenger's heads. We have sunshades for the rear passenger windows, height adjustable seat belts for the driver and the front passenger, and four-way adjustable ratchet-style headrests. The model we're driving has charcoal leather upholstery, and then we have brown stitching to give it a little bit of contrast. The center section of the seat upholstery is perforated because these seats are both heated and ventilated. The front doors are made from almost entirely soft-touch plastic, so we have a soft-touch injection molded upper sill right here, and you'll even find soft plastics around the bottle holder compartment down here on the bottom. The center section of the door right by the armrest features more of that brown stitching and then matching imitation leather upholstery. Since we're driving the sport trim of the G80, we find carbon fiber inside the cabin because apparently nothing says sporty like replacing real wood trim with carbon fiber. Moving over to the dashboard, we find a fairly upright design with a soft touch injection molded upper dashboard. Again, more of that carbon fiber below that. We have a metallic strip that runs the length of the dashboard. On the passenger side, we find a moderately sized glove compartment. I was not able to fit a large tablet computer inside there. In the middle of the dashboard, we have a center channel speaker module, two large air vents, and then a large touchscreen infotainment system. The touchscreen infotainment system in the center of the dashboard is a little bit different than we find in the larger Genesis G90 model. You can control this with either the touchscreen or with the control knob in the center of the dashboard. This system supports Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, as well as Sirius XM data services that give us things like traffic information, weather information, and fuel pricing. There's also Hyundai's latest Blue Link telematic system, which functions very much like General Motors' OnStar system. Below the infotainment system, we find the vehicle's power button, and then the controls for the climate control system. The Genesis G80 offers sort of a three-zone climate control system. The front two are automatic climate control zones, as you can see by the temperature knobs on each side. The rear has an adjustment knob, so you can make the air either warmer or colder, but it's not automatic in the same way. Beneath that, we have some physical buttons for the infotainment system. Power button over here. 
tune and file knob right over here. You'll find the mapping database on an SD card below this little door. And then we have some direct access buttons right here below the single slot optical disc player. Below that, we find a storage compartment, which is large enough to hold an iPhone 7 Plus, but not if you want to close the door. You do have to remove it from there if you want to roll this door forward. This is also where we find a USB input, an auxiliary input, and a Qi wireless charging mat. The model that we're driving has an electronic shifter. We push the shift button right here by my thumb and then pull back for drive. We push forward for reverse. And if you want to park the vehicle, that's a button just there in front of the shifter. Behind the shifter, we find a button that controls one of my favorite new car features, the auto brake hold system. When this system is engaged, it keeps the brake pressure on at stoplights so you don't have to keep your foot on the pedal. Next to that, we have a drive mode button, which looks very much like the other versions of the G80. However, in addition to controlling the way the transmission and engine behave, this G80 also has an adaptive suspension system, so this adjusts the way that suspension responds. To the right of the shifter, we find two cup holders right here behind that little door. And then behind that, we find the controls for the heated and ventilated seats, 360-degree camera system, direct access button to the Blue Link services, parking sensor enable disable, and then the controls for the infotainment and navigation system. We have a phone button. There's a dedicated home button, some direct access buttons to various features in the system, and then we have the controller knob, which is one of the other ways you can interact with the system. Again, this uses a touchscreen and this controller knob. You can choose which one you prefer. Personally, I think that makes this system a little bit more intuitive to operate than systems that depend solely on a control knob. Between the front seats, we find a leather app center armrest. It opens in a bifold fashion, and inside we find a 12 volt power port and a USB charge only port. The instrument cluster features two large dials for the speedometer and the tachometer, two smaller dials inside of those, and then a large LCD in the center between them. The LCD gives us the status of the vehicle safety systems, including the standard attention alert system. We also have the ability to alter certain vehicle settings like the heads up display, the driving assist systems, doors, lights, sound, other convenient settings like that. You have your typical trip computer information right over here. And of course, turn by turn navigation directions if that system was activated. The heads-up display in this vehicle is one of the crispest in the mid-size luxury sedan category. We also have a decent amount of information. In addition to the speedometer that we're seeing right now, we also get blind spot information, which is handy in traffic, and we get turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions. We don't find media information in this screen like we do see in certain BMW models, but this is right up there with the BMW system in terms of overall crispness. Some heads-up displays like the ones that we see in certain Lexus and Jaguar models just aren't as crisp and easy to read as this. The steering wheel is a three-spoke design with sport grips up top and shift paddles that are attached to the steering wheel, not to the steering column. We have down on the left and up over there on the right. The left side of the steering wheel is where we find infotainment controls, including volume, mute, track up, down, mode, and dedicated phone hang-up and pickup buttons. And then on the right side of the steering wheel, we find the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control system, as well as the controls for that multifunction display between the speedometer and the tachometer. We use this button to change between the pages, and then use the roller knob to adjust the options. The 3.3 liter twin turbo V6 has a very different feel out on the road than the 3.8 liter V6 or even the 5 liter naturally aspirated V8 engine. This feels much more peppy than the V8 because we have a lot more torque at lower RPMs than we find even in that V8 engine. However, the V8 still produces more torque overall and more horsepower and that's why this model is still slower than the 5 liter V8 in the same car. We ran from 0 to 60 in 5.3 seconds in this particular model. 4.7 if you get the 5 liter V8. Some people have been asking me about the 0 to 60 time in this twin turbo G80 because it is below entries like the BMW 540i, which will do it in about 4.8 seconds. Now, the 540i in theory produces less power and less torque than this engine. So, some people have been asking me, do they think these horsepower and torque numbers are correct? Yes, I think they are. The reason that this is slower than the 540i, however, is because this is considerably heavier. Regardless of how you configure your Genesis, this is always going to be a few hundred pounds heavier than any of the direct competition. This is, for instance, about 20 to 25% heavier than a Jaguar XF. However, because we get more power and more torque out of this engine, this ends up being just about as fast as a Jaguar XF 35T. This is also just about as fast 0 to 60 as the Audi A6 3.0T. In our braking test, we ran from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 118 feet, which is just a little bit shorter than the comparable G80 V8, because this is just a little bit lighter. However, this will take a little bit longer than some of those European entries that are lighter weight than this. 
That said, 118 feet is, of course, a very short stopping distance in general terms, and that's because we have very wide tires on the G80. It's obvious that when designing this vehicle, the engineers were really targeting the meat of the midsize luxury sedan segment. So we have tires on this vehicle that are very comparable to the Audi A6 or the BMW 340i. However, the wide tires cannot compensate for the added weight. So when it comes to handling, I'm going to give this a B minus. It's not that the G80 handles poorly by any stretch of the imagination. This is an awful lot of fun to drive out on these winding mountain roads. But when you start really pushing this car harder, it's obvious that it's heavier than the competition and handling does suffer a little as a result. When it comes to the overall handling feel, the 3.8 liter version of the Genesis does feel a little bit more nimble because it is the lightest version. Although you would normally think that this 3.3 liter V6 twin turbo engine would be lighter than the 5 liter V8, it's actually not that much lighter. The curb weight difference between the two is quite small. That's probably because this 3.3 liter twin turbo V6 engine is a little on the heavy side for a twin turbo V6, and the 5 liter V8 that we find under the hood is actually quite light for a 5 liter V8. Out on a rougher road surface like the gravel road we're driving on now, the adaptive suspension system in this model is instantly noticeable versus the regular suspension in the other G80 models. This delivers a much smoother, much more polished ride out on road surfaces like this, or even out on the open highway on broken pavement. Now, in normal mode, this vehicle can feel a little bit floatier than the regular G80, but I actually find that attractive, a little bit refreshing even, because most vehicles in this segment are going after very, very firm rides, and they're leaving a lot of the comfort behind. Now, that's not to say that this feels like a 1980s Cadillac. It certainly doesn't, but this does feel more like a Mercedes-Benz E-Class from the previous generation. If, of course, you want the softest ride in this segment, that would be found in versions of the Mercedes E-Class with the optional adaptive air suspension because that is going to be even cushier than what we see in the G80. In our cabin noise score at 50 miles an hour, we scored a very impressive 67 decibels in this cabin, which makes this one of the quietest luxury sedans we've tested. In fact, this is actually quieter than the Lexus LS that we tested last. It's also quieter than the Audi A6 or the BMW 5 Series or that Jaguar XF. Over a week of very mixed driving, we have averaged 20 and a half miles per gallon in this vehicle. That's just a little bit above the EPA score of 20 miles per gallon. However, I'm going to have to give this a C- when it comes to overall fuel economy in this category because you will find notably higher fuel economy for similar levels of performance in some of the European entries. Some of the Delta may have something to do with the fact that this is a very fun car to drive, so we have been driving this pretty hard out here on winding mountain roads. But a lot of it also has to do with the fact that this is a relatively heavy vehicle, as I keep saying. And my daily commute does take me up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass. And generally, heavier vehicles tend to score poorer on that fuel economy test than lighter vehicles. Although this 3.3 liter twin turbo V6 is not quite as fast as the optional V8 in the G80, this is definitely the engine that I would pick. Although some people may dislike turbo lag, I think that the massive amount of torque we get out of this engine and the very, very broad torque curve that we get is definitely worth the trade-off. You'll definitely notice that when hill climbing because if you're driving in a relaxed fashion, this vehicle doesn't need to downshift the way even the V8 engine that's optional under the hood does. And of course, if you want to start driving this car hard, the acceleration feels much more linear than we feel in the V8 engine or the V6 engine because of that very, very broad torque curve. And of course, there's the fact that this engine will get several miles per gallon better fuel economy than the V8 engine, even though it's only about half a second slower, zero to 60. The G80 is not quite as sharp, not quite as nimble as some of the competition. It definitely won't handle quite as well, and the fuel economy is a little bit lower, but I actually appreciate the fact that Genesis didn't just create a Me Too vehicle in this segment. They've really focused heavily on good performance, zero to 60, an excellent ride, and a very, very quiet cabin. When Hyundai separated the Genesis brand from the Hyundai brand, they made the Genesis models a little bit more expensive than they were in the past. The G80 now starts at $41,750 for the 3.8 liter version. The least expensive version of the 3.3 liter turbo that we were driving this week is $55,250. If you want the 5 liter V8, that'll set you back at least $57,000. That puts the G80 more firmly in the midsize luxury car category. In the past, it lived somewhere between entries like the Chrysler 300 
and the BMW 5 Series in terms of overall pricing. But now that it's on its own with its own luxury brand, and now that we have that new luxury car twin turbo V6, it is definitely pushing towards the Audi and the Volvo in this segment. On first glance, the 3.3 liter Sport appears to be quite a bit more expensive than the 3.8 liter V6. However, when you comparably equip them, the difference ends up shrinking because the ultimate trim of the G80 with the 3.8 liter V6 engine would set you back 51580 and it doesn't have all the same equipment that we find in the 3.3 Sport. In addition to giving you more power, the Sport trim gives you the adaptive suspension that gives you a slightly softer ride under normal driving conditions and a firmer ride when you're in the Sport mode. We also get the quad exhaust, the Sport seats, and the staggered tires. Although the 5 liter V8 in the G80 is definitely fun, and it's quite unique because it's one of the only remaining naturally aspirated V8 engines you can buy in this category, I think the 3.3 liter T is a better buy all the way around, and I also liked the way it drove a little bit more than the 5 liter V8. In terms of overall performance, it's not that far off the V8 at 5.3 seconds 0 to 60 versus 4.7 for the 5 liter model, but it is notably faster than the 3.8 liter V6, which does that same task in 6.5. The 3.3 liter turbocharged engine also helps the G80 compete more directly in this segment that is full of twin turbo six cylinder engines. The first logical competitor is the Audi A6 with the 3 liter V6 engine. It'll set you back $58,600 starting $64,600 when comparably equipped to the model that we were driving. That's about a $9,000 delta between the two. Now it does shrink a little bit if you want to compare the A6 to the G80 with all wheel drive. Some review outlets have clocked the A6 with a 3 liter engine as going faster from 0 to 60 than we did. But in our tests, we repeatedly got 5.4 seconds. That means that in our tests, the A6 with that engine was a little bit slower than the G80 Sport, but it's also a little bit slower 0 to 60 than the BMW 540i. When it comes to overall handling, the models are actually not that far apart. Because of the general design of the Audi Quattro system, the A6 has a weight distribution front and rear that's perhaps a little bit closer to a Honda Accord than a BMW 5 Series. Although Audi has an excellent history of tuning their platforms to try and reduce the effect of that extra weight up front, it is noticeable in that the A6 feels a little bit less reluctant to turn in than even something like the G80. Now the G80 is still heavier, so if the tires and the vehicles are comparable, the A6 is still likely going to go around the corner a little bit faster than the G80. But the G80 has a slightly better balanced, slightly more nimble feel than the last A6 that we tested. Next up we have the Lexus GS350. The F Sport is probably the closest trim that you can get to something like the G80 in its Sport trim. That will start at $59,920, already more expensive than the base price of the Genesis, and if you comparably equip it to the model that we were driving, it'll be $65,000. Depending on how you equip the Lexus GS, it will be between nine dollars and $10,000 more expensive than the Genesis. Hyundai is following a very similar path with creating the Genesis brand as Toyota did back when they created the Lexus brand, but with a twist, because Genesis seems to be more willing to compete with the German entries in this segment than Toyota does with the Lexus brands. That's why we see a twin turbo V6 engine in the G80, but over in the Lexus side we find a very conservative turbocharged four-cylinder engine and then a naturally aspirated six and V8. The conservative ethos that we see with the Lexus brand really hurts it when it comes to performance. Because if you want the GS350 with all-wheel drive, for instance, you end up with a 6-speed automatic, not an 8-speed automatic, and that does hurt the 0-60 to 60 performance in real-world driving. In addition to that, the Genesis brand has been posting excellent initial reliability numbers. For the longest time, one of the big reasons to buy a Lexus over the European luxury vehicles was the actual reliability of the vehicle. But if this continues, Genesis may really be fighting Lexus head-on for that as well. Handling feel and handling precision are things that the Lexus GS does very well. But because of the lack of power that we find in the GS350, I suspect that the G80 Sport would actually be faster around the average track than the Lexus, even though the Lexus is going to be the better handling option. Next up, we have the Infiniti Q70. The Q70 is one of the oldest entries in this segment, and it is really starting to show. It starts at $50,100, which is less expensive than the G80, but we get less equipment as well. There's also no direct corollary to the 3.3 liter turbocharged engine in the Q70. You either get the naturally aspirated V6 or the naturally aspirated V8. Personally, I find the Q70 with the V8 engine a ton of fun. However, you should know it is really heavy up front. 57% of the weight is carried on the front axle, making it even heavier up front than the Audi A6. 
It's reminiscent of an American muscle car in reality. The front end is less willing to turn in the corners, but it has a decent amount of low end torque and it is pretty easy to spin the rear tires. It's an awful lot of fun. But as a result of that weight balance, it doesn't feel as nimble as the Genesis G80, even though it is notably lighter. The Q70L is kind of an interesting twist in this segment. It doesn't cost that much more than the regular Q70. However, we do get class leading rear legroom. However, as I said earlier, headroom is still a little limited. So depending on the size of the adults you want to put in the back of the vehicle, you may find that the back seats of the G80 are more comfortable than the long wheelbase options we find. Another interesting alternative and a more direct competitor to the G80 is the all new Volvo S90. The S90 was all new for 2017 and then in an odd twist, Volvo changed it for 2018 and they added about five inches of overall length. The five inch stretch goes all to rear legroom, making the S90 one of the longest vehicles in this segment. It actually is almost as long as the last generation Lexus LS. On the downside, very much like we see with the Infiniti Q70 stretch, they made the vehicle longer, but they didn't give it any more headroom in the rear. I found the seats in the S90 to be more comfortable, especially the front passenger seat, which has the same range of motion as the driver. That's not something we see in the Genesis. The S90 T6 all-wheel drive is $54,100, but we get less equipment than we find in the Genesis Sport. In terms of overall performance, it will be about two tenths of a second slower. There's also the all new T8 model in the S90. That's an all wheel drive plug-in hybrid system and that should get that model zero to 60 just about as fast as the G80 with the V8 engine. However, that model will also be more expensive than the G80. And regardless of how you configure your Volvo and your Genesis, the two vehicles will be about $8,000 apart. My bottom line with the G80 is that this is absolutely the best value in the midsize luxury sedan segment. The G80 with the 3.3 liter twin turbo V6 engine finally gives this vehicle the thrust and the feel that we find in the European entries with their turbocharged engines at a much, much lower price. If you're shopping in the midsize luxury sedan segment and you're looking to spend under $60,000, the G80 is unquestionably my top pick. I would take the G80 with the 3.3 liter twin turbo engine before I took the BMW 5 Series with their 2 liter engine or the A6 with the 2 liter engine as well. It's simply a better buy. We get more car for our money. The G80 also has a very, very comfortable back seat. So if back seat comfort is important to you, it really does score above the European entries in this segment. A solid runner up in this segment for me would be the Volvo S90 in that 2018 form with the extra length in the back seat. We don't really know what the reliability will be like in the S90. Volvo has been below Genesis in terms of overall reliability, and this new S90 is actually being manufactured in a brand new factory in China. It's no longer being manufactured in Sweden. The reason for that is the factory in Sweden is out of capacity and they had to shift the production somewhere else. Now production of the S90 may actually move to the United States when Volvo finishes their new factory here, but we don't really know all the details about that transition yet. So for the moment, predicted reliability could be a problem with the S90. It really is just more of an unknown at this point. That said, however, the S90 is going to be more efficient. I also think it's more comfortable than the G80. It really depends on how important reliability versus comfort is to you. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and this has been the 2018 Genesis G80. Be sure and check out those related videos down there at the bottom of your screen. Subscribe to this channel, and if you want to support us, you can head over to patreon.com and find us over there as well. I'll see you later.